Hello and welcome to the next in the series of the Birdies House Building Conversations. My name is Elaine Farkson Black. I'm a partner in our house building team and I specialise in the planning aspects of all residential developments, especially new builds. Um, as you know, the house building sector is currently faced with a challenge of building more homes more quickly and of a higher quality to address the current housing shortage and meet Scottish Government's aims for everyone to have a safe, good quality and affordable home that meets their needs in a location that they want to be in. Then we throw into the mix the post-Brexit skills shortage, increasing material costs and ambitious government targets on carbon, emission, carbon emissions to uh, combat climate change. And it's pretty clear that house builders are going to have to come up with some new methods of construction to meet the challenges ahead. I am delighted, therefore, to be joined today by Stuart Delgarno of the Stuart Milne Group. Stuart's been with SMG for 36 years, starting originally as an apprentice draftsman and working up to his way to his current role as a director of product development. Uh, Stuart's responsible for research and development across the group, focusing on the introduction of new products, processes and materials, which includes off-site construction, lean site assembly, digital working, building information modelling, low carbon homes and advanced off-site timber building, timber building systems. And uh, Stuart's innovative uh, thinking has seen him being recognised by the industry as an R&D champion and he is project director of Advanced Industrialised Methods for the Construction of Homes, AIMCH, which is a multi-million pound collaborative housing project which we're going to come on to and chat about uh, in a little bit um, in a minute. And also with me today is my colleague, Jane McMonagall, um, who's a part, also a partner in a house building team. And Jane provides advice on construction, infrastructure and engineering pro uh, projects and acts for a wide range of developers and house builders. So Stuart and Jane, welcome to you both um, this afternoon. Um, Stuart, I'm wondering whether you're sitting wearing a white lab coat by the sounds of all of this. I've got you, I've got you in a laboratory coming up and thinking, making things up. Um, Let's start a little bit. I mentioned their AIMCH and you're obviously project director and I know the project was set up about three years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why it was set up, you know, what its aims are and who's involved in it? Well, hi, Elaine. Uh, yes, I'm a bit of a mad inventor at times, but uh, focused on delivery from an industry perspective. So uh, AMCH is a collaborative R&D project focused on uh, um, the mainstream upscaling of panelised uh, modern methods of construction. Um, Stuart Mon Group are the lead industry partner. We have got the UK's largest private developer, Barrett's. Uh, London and Quadrant, who are the UK's largest affordable housing provider. We have an SME, which is Foster uh, Roofing Group, specialises in roof cladding systems and renewables. Uh, and also two of the UK's leading research establishments with the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, doing the academic uh, research and dissemination, and the Manufacturing Technology Centre, who are specialists in the, the, the man manufacturing of, of goods and systems. Uh, with a focus on automotive, but now looking to transfer some of that knowledge into construction. So the purpose of the project says scaling up of off-site construction. Um, this has come about through the uh, previous project we did called EMC4, which focused on uh, energy efficiency of buildings. And um, the, there's a number of drivers affecting the marketplace, skills reduction being one of them, increasing quality, increasing output. Uh, and a general push um, or a policy decision from government to move and adopt new modern methods of construction, uh, which has led us to uh, the MCH project. So you, you mentioned that you've been kind of focused on the panelised, but you know, have you been trialling various um, different parts of improving the kind of modern construction? Uh, we are, uh, the UK government have, have uh, identified seven categories of modern methods of construction, as they call it. We are focused on category two, which is the panelised systems. Effectively, we've been using our heritage in Scotland of timber frame construction to develop up uh, more advanced timber frame construction techniques. So essentially insulating it, closing it, fitting windows uh, in the wall systems, looking at closed part walls, looking at pre-finished floor cassettes, looking at ground uh, erect systems where we can um, felt batten and tile the roof on the ground and lift it in one go. And then maybe a nod towards a, maybe a hybrid system in the future where we've kind of got a pod and panel uh, uh, system, which is a category two and category seven system, 
where we can drop in bathroom pods or ensuite pods as part of the superstructure of the uh, building. So our focus is essentially building the superstructure of the home in a day um, when watertight, insulated, secure and safe, ready for the internal and external works to commence. So we build effectively build it in a day. That's impressive. Yep. Seven hours to be pre precise, um, as you might say. Uh, one crane day. Um, so the foundation's uh, done uh, uh, beforehand. Uh, we've been developing some scaffoldless erect technology, so effectively building the superstructure of the timber frame shell without scaffolding. Uh, the roof is done the week prior, uh, but the whole house complete in just under seven seven hours. Well, that will go a long way towards uh, delivering the number of homes that we that, that we're needing in that kind of short uh, short space of time. Um, you mentioned there you touched on kind of skills and and quality, and we had on one of our previous conversations, um, Douglas Cochran, um, we were talking about the new homes quality code. So, how do you see that you know these kind of modern methods um, will? help in terms of the skill shortage and, and and but also make sure that we we um, achieve that higher quality i think it's pretty important in the private sector i mean it's the the uh, biggest delivery uh, provider of housing is in the private sector so skills and quality is affecting them consumers expect more and more nowadays so the more we can do in the factory with a quality controlled way uh, then the easier it is on the building site so for example if we fit the windows we fit the insulation we fit other elements in the factory and we can build the house wind and watertight in a day uh, without external cladding finished on it then there's more there's less likelihood to weather damages uh, squeaks and um, defects that can be um, built um, with a brick and block construction which takes longer or more exposed to rain and you're uh, more susceptible to, to skills mm -hmm. skills is a big issue that's affecting um, everybody at the moment in terms of bricklaying skills in particular so using a panelised uh, shell allows the bricklayer, because you still need a bricklayer to, to, to clad the home uh, to get you the um, finishes you're looking for. Um, but they're more productive um, and they're not having to work so hard and lifting heavier components and not having to put insulation and windows and other complicated elements in. So the bricklayer is building essentially a cladding to the, to the template of the building that's already in front of him. So it makes him more productive, more efficient. He can earn more money. Arguably, he can brick five houses a week rather than four, and um, he doesn't have to lift so heavy things. So making this, the job more attractive um, and, and more productive for the limited resources of bricklayers we've got. So hence overcoming some of that skills issues with those critical trades that's impact in the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sounds, you know, obviously with the, the, the way you were just describing that, that more of the um, the house is built off site and then taken on. I'm wearing my planning hat and I'm thinking about there's a focus on placemaking and sometimes, you know, house builders are criticised for having standard house types. Um, do you think that kind of moving towards having more of this kind of off-site construction, is that going to reduce design variety or can I still use those panelised system in kind of bespoke type housing? Well, I mean, uh, placemaking is absolutely fundamental to any private developer or even, uh, you know, an affordable uh, developer. We've got to create beautiful places and that's what we, we do with these systems we're using. Um, the type of technology we've developed, is essentially the core of the building is built uh, very efficiently, but can be clad with a variety of materials and finishes to give you a, a plethora of different uh, street scenes to suit the ro local vernacular. Um, so, you know, um, you can have a red brick house if you want to be in Manchester, you can have a granite house if you want to be in Aberdeen, or you can have a Cotswold stone if you want to be in, the, in Oxfordshire and uh, sort of finish on it. So we're very used to the fact that the standardisation is a, is a good word in our uh, language. It helps us be efficient, it helps us maintain quality, reduce costs, etc. Uh, but put these houses into areas that are uh, purpose built or, or designed specifically with that placemaking uh, agenda in mind where the value is created and we're creating uh, communities there. Part of the output of the project is a, an affordable homes uh, pattern book specifically tailored for smaller builders um, where they've got an off the shelf uh, pre-configured approved house range that can be configured to suit any location uh, in the UK. Uh, with a, a range of predetermined fenestrations and street scenes and house types that can be plotted together 
uh, to comply with the planning requirements and the local material requirements. So we feel that this is the way to go um, that, that, you know, we have to embrace standardisation. You've seen it in the car industry where the standardised components very well. They've often got a kit of parts. We've now got a kit of parts for, for housing technologies. Uh, and you can finish them to suit, you know, that local requirement. So we're very confident that we're building great places, award-winning uh, developments using the type of technologies that's fundamental to the principles of the private uh, developers and affordable developers that are part of AMCH. So, Jane, just listening to, to that, and I, was, I know you're immersed in, in the construction as, aspects of it, what are the legal implications of, you know, the panelised system, the off-site, you know, modular construction? Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a house builder, you know, from a legal point of view, what are the things I should be aware of or be, be live to? Um, I'd say, Elaine, the first consideration is cost um, and the risk of making advanced payments to contractors and suppliers without actually having your hands on the goods, if you like. Um, so our experience is often that suppliers look for, say, 20% advanced payment. Now, that's before any manufacturing or assembly process really takes place. But there's nothing to take security over in respect to these advanced payments. So some of our clients being asked to make these payments are looking for advanced payment bonds. So advanced payment bonds are still pretty few and far between, actually, in our experience. They're quite difficult to obtain. And what they do is they essentially protect the payments made to the contractor up front. So if the contractor fails to meet their contractual obligations, the issuer will, will refund the advanced payments made or at least the, the unearned element of the advanced payment, if you like. Um, as I said, they're quite difficult to secure in the current market, but it will be interesting to see if we see more of these and if they become more obtainable in the next few years, given the, the increased use of, of um, off-site assembly, etc. Secondly, I'd say the use of, of what we call off-site materials or vesting agreements um, are off-site materials agreements, sorry, or vesting agreements are, are likely to be increased for off-site modular construction in particular. So where materials are to be fully paid for that remain off-site without proper contractual protections in place, particularly in Scotland, for the party who has paid problems can arise if you have a supplier or a contractor later becoming insolvent and the items haven't actually been delivered to site yet and incorporated into the works. So the solution really is to ensure that the payer has got title to the materials prior to delivery and on payment. And that's where we enter into these separate off-site materials agreements and vesting agreements. And they really set out when ownership of the materials will pass and that will be on payment and not delivery to site. So that's already recognised. The SBCC forms of contract in Scotland have an off-site materials agreement as an option um, and they refer to such being put in place if, if you've got this type of arrangement. So I would say that we're drafting a lot of these at the moment. I've drafted more of these agreements in the past 12 months than I ever have in my career to date. So um, definitely a way, of, a way of dealing with that risk. Another point to consider, I would say, be insurances would be insurances. So insurances for materials when they're off site and then importantly catering for, for what party is responsible for the materials or pods um, if it's full off site modular as and when they're in transit. So in our experience, that's probably typically a contractor or supplier risk if you like. And lastly, I would just mention um, control over the works generally could be an issue. So make sure you can access and inspect sites where construction is ongoing to do an independent check of progress and programme, checking everything is essentially on track. And importantly, that what has been paid for is actually there where you expect it to be in the factory or wherever that may be. And then if it if I look at it then from the house purchaser point of view, so I'm coming along and I'm coming to buy the house that's that's had, you know, kind of the off-site part uh, done as well. Is, is there any issues for me as a house purchaser? Does it impact on my new, you know, my new home warranty? No, it shouldn't at all. That's an easy answer, Elaine. So if, if everything is wrapped up as part of the construction, which it should be in the ultimate contractor's responsibility, then there, there shouldn't be an issue with that. Excellent. Um, Stuart, I don't know if you want to have any comments on anything that, that Jane said um, there in terms of the kind of insurances and the, the transit. No, it's really good uh, to hear what Jane's saying there. I think that's more focused at um, maybe the Category 1 modular market. Right. Uh, from an AMCH point of view, we're certainly focused at the CAT 2 panelised systems, and we would typically come under normal terms and conditions of a contract 
uh, goods uh, paid after our installation on site, um, we do a supply and erect or a supply only package paid uh, 30 days after as a normal um, GCT subcontract former form of construction. We have done vesting certificates and payments up front on very large volume sites mm -hmm. where we're supplied maybe 10 or 12 homes per week. Uh, and that requires us to stockpile goods in the factory, um, just as described under that contract. Typically, that large volume housing sites, such as the MOD type projects, which is a total build out. But for typical private and affordable developments, we don't come under the same um, payment criteria as maybe that uh, Cat 1 modular yes. would, would do. As regards to warranty, our focus at AMCH is very much about getting mortgage, getting a warranty and getting insurance. That's fundamental. We want no comebacks. It's a fit and forget solution. We do not want a fit and worry solution. And our focus is very much on that through using panelised Cat1 systems that have been proven and have a heritage uh, over you know, the last 50 years or so uh, built off of the, the timber frame market, uh, I would say, in Scotland uh, predominantly. We kind of touched on the, the fact speed, um, the fact that you can do this do this in seven hours, which I find um, fantastic. They um, and you know the skills and the quality. I suppose you know net zero, you know kind of carbon emissions is obviously the kind of focus. It's a key plank of Scottish government's housing to twenty forty vision. How do you see the kind of modern technology and the offsite construction helping uh, the house building industry to reduce its carbon footprint? Well, I think a key fab, a key thing of that will be two aspects. One is the fabric efficiency of the the home, so it'll be a focus on higher energy le uh, efficiency levels, thermal bridging, etc., to keep the heat in. So, uh, panelised systems and timber in particular has 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 a heritage of having you know good U values and, and such like there. So, we we at AMCH are already focused on um, achieving current regs in Scotland. 31% uh, improvement in England, which is a set change to June next year, and a 70% sort of net zero carbon with a fabric first approach. So looking at U values around about 0.18 to 0.2 within a typical 140 and buffering wall construction. Uh, closed panel, so we are moving to closed panel technology, so insulated in the factories, windows fitted so you get a good air tightness, you get in the, the insulation factory fitted so they know the U values between the design uh, intent and the as built construction is likely to be very close. We've done a lot of um, um, testing on sites to prove that our as built U values are as equivalent as our design intent. So that's one of the key things going forward. So building a good fabric is where we're at, keeping the energy in, and then obviously ventilating it correctly, and then plugging in the type of technologies you need to get the net zero, such as your PVs, wastewater heat recovery, flue gas heat recovery for boilers in the short term, uh, and then a move away from gas boilers into air source heat pumps in the long term, and the introduction of battery storage, which which is obviously pretty much a done deal for how to get to zero carbon. AMCH will be building a, a, a net zero carbon demonstrator uh, in the last year of the project uh, in partnership with Salford University and doing a lot of um, monitoring of that home. And we see that being a bit of a forerunner for a, a maybe a future project where we can do some large scale demonstrations uh, building off the back of the offsite uh, thing. So build a good fabric uh, using offsite systems, panelized, um, and then the, the, the final thing is use timber. Uh, embodied carbon is pretty much important. Uh, no point in just focusing on carbon in use if you're using high carbon intensive materials in the first place. So you're not really getting the, the, the global uh, benefits you'd expect. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work looking at embodied carbon between brick and block construction and timber frame. We estimate that it's between 35 and 40 percent less embodied carbon on a timber home compared to a masonry one. That's roughly 10 tonnes of uh, embodied CO2 uh, per four uh, bedroom home um, uh, being converted away from brick and block to, to timber. Uh, plus also the sequestration benefits of the um, forests, which is not currently uh, uh, considered within embodied carbon. So we know that south of the border in England, they are uh, likely to regulate embodied carbon to become a building regs requirement going forward. We, we are planning for that in terms of the future thinking and future proofing of the systems. I expect in Scotland, they'll be looking at embodied carbon as part of the Scottish building regs going forward and not just carbon in use as being a solution to the net zero carbon challenge. 
And and Jane, do, can can you think of other um you know, kind of advantages for householders and developers in you know kind of moving towards the kind of offsite um, system and based on developments that you or sites that you've been involved in, are there ones that you think might be better suited to it than others? Yeah, definitely. And probably comments I would make would be in relation to the various off-site methods, if you like, um, of construction. So some of what Stuart's already covered. So, you know, quality and consistency of product and efficiency as well. So they're all definitely higher um, with, with less likely interference or damage from other works ongoing. So it's just a, a practical observation, but that, that's definitely the case. Um, less external factors affecting progress on programmes. So um, this type of construction is very much suited for weather beat or remote sites. So if construction is taking place off-site in a factory, for example, there's less chance of weather delays, so greater programme certainty, and that's a, a great advantage for developers. Um, we've seen in projects that we've done some very tight city centre sites are ideal for this method, so there's no need to find a specific part of the site to assemble, um, or where there's a risk of damage, for example, so that can all be done off-site unless less space in, a, space in a tight site is required, albeit you can have heavier crane usage, so again it very much depends on, on the particular site in the project. And we've also seen um, it's been ideal for some brownfield sites that we've worked on as well. So it can be really good to separate out remediation and ground remediation and ground issues and the assembly stages of construction. So if there's a problem or defect that later appears, it can be easier to identify exactly where that defect is coming from, where the elements are, are dealt with separately. So yeah, all quite positive experiences from our clients who have adopted these off-site methods to date anyway. It's, it's good that it... I suppose it covers lots of different sites. You know, we're we're going towards yeah. urban regeneration and and doing some pretty tight sites. So the fact that mm -hmm. actually, you know, they're they've got no room for storage or those kind of things. And, and as you say, and Stuart had touched on before as well about the weather and the fact that it's that the sites, you know, the the house is open to the elements for that length of time and then kind of needs to um, needs to dry out. Um, it's true. I love a quote, so I always like to like pop in a wee quote to one of these. And it was Charles Dickens that said that the difference between construction and creation is that something that's constructed can only be loved after it's built, but something created is loved before it exists. And it seems to me that you this is clearly a labour of love for you, product uh, kind of development, and that you're combining the kind of two. What's the next stage? I mean, when do the when does the tri when do the trials finish? And then what's the next stage in terms of encouraging house builders to adopt the construction message? You you did mention the pattern book. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm 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 loving the creation piece. I'm, I'm I live and breathe this every day, and, and absolutely love it. Uh, I think it's the future of where we need to get to, and you know we're we're early adopters and 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 working with others to pull things together. So collaboration is is a fundamental uh, uh, anchor for AMCH as well. Um, going forward, um, our next steps is really to capitalise on some of the manufacturing stuff, which we've not talked about. AMCH is also looking at scaling up the supply side of it. So we you know we're comfortable we can deliver the homes we've built there. Uh, on three developments, uh, a, a number of prototype homes, um, which are now all occupied and sold, and they've all been um, fit for purpose, got insurance, got warranty, and, and delivered well. Um, but one of the challenges we've got is uh, um, having the supply chain in place to deliver these new systems. So um, part of the project is looking at future factories. So we've designed the uh, digital twins for three future factory options, uh, a large scale automated hub, a manual hub, and a small scale um, pop-up uh, factory solution in the future. Uh, we've looked at a new digital ERP system for a manufacturing supply chain, so you can start to process this volume a lot more efficiently. Uh, and then the last piece is looking at robotics and automation in terms of increasing the ability to produce the closed panel category two systems that we've been trialling and developing um, that are within two or three percent of the viability of masonry construction unlike modular you know we're very much on the money commercially uh, which is advantageous no doubt and we're seeing a large uh, demand now arising so the risk from uh, uh, is more on the demand side and being able to service that demand so um the robotics and automation has been a major piece for stuart milne and uh, you know we've now developed um, a state-of-the-art world-leading uh, robotic production line seven robots that all produce that type of product and that's going into our new facilities that we're investing in in scotland at um, falkirk uh, and will be a refit of our facilities in, in um, 
Whitney and Oxfordshire uh, were really world leading uh, equipment. So creating high value jobs at the same time. Um, and that's going to double our output of these types of systems to service the, the uptake that we potentially see coming. So that's a big piece of the, the, the journey as well that we maybe haven't fully uh, touched on. But beyond this, it's now about the exploitation for us. So it's concluding all the works, uh, all the trials are more or less concluded, all the productivity studies are concluded. We have to complete um, a number of pieces of work that we're doing in body carbon, whole life cost, and health and safety risk profiling is another element that we're looking at. And it's a scaling up of the system. So it's about exploiting that on the Barrett's and LNQ sites, about then exploiting the delivery of uh, actually investing in factories, future factories, as Stuart Milner are doing currently, to service that demand uh, to, to, to demonstrate a step change for others to follow. And we're beginning to see a pool. Um, I mentioned the pattern book, and that's one of the key outputs is that um, um, they'll be available to small uh, developers. Because you know, unlike the Barretts and Ellen Kuhn and Stuart Mullins, not everybody's got a technical department. They can process all of this uh, good stuff. So um, we've essentially developed a range of 19 affordable homes that are pre-configured, type approved, um, fabric ready for zero carbon in the future, heat pump friendly, um, that can be used for affordable housing, that comply with the uh, housing for varying needs standards in Scotland and also uh, national design standards in, in England. Um, and we see this as being a, a pretty important uh, opportunity for local authorities and uh, housing associations, rural operators, SMEs, um, to effectively buy a pre-configured unit off the shelf uh, under a license agreement. So all the technical information is available, all the construction information, it's in a BIM um, uh, Revit model or in PDF drawings, if, if you prefer to use 2D drawings, uh, with all the construction information, costs and supply chain pre-configured. Um, we have the support of Homes England for the sort of uptake of that, uh, potentially discussion, uh, discussing with various investors uh, on development finance and um, mortgage uh, finance. Uh, from a retail point of view for the retail mortgage for these homes um, over at least uh, three 20 year um, uh, um, schemes so 60 year design life minimum um, and that will be available spring next year for those interested in both the Scottish and in the, the English market that will come through the supply chain side so essentially through Stuart Mill initially and in partnership with LNQ and some of the HA partners that they are involved with so that sort of thinking of pattern books and pre-configured homes in the future um, that can be built in any location, as I mentioned, with the whole placemaking piece is very important. So it can be uh, built in any location um, is really something I think would be quite exciting for those who maybe don't, aren't of the scale that um, Barrett's and LNQ are and, and don't have that technology and know-how. And uh, they can essentially um, get access to that under a, a free of charge to use license agreement using your regional architect and your regional builder to build them. No, that, that, that's great. As you say, the fact that it's, you know, local authorities, your, you know, your SMEs, which we're trying to encourage, you know, kind of back into the, the sector. Um, the fact that the project has come up, uh, you know, with all the, um, done all the trials and the information and then effectively, you know, I can access that as the kind of smaller um, house builder um, kind of is, is fantastic. And if I want to find out kind of more about it, um, there, there's a website for EINCH. Yeah. No. A really good website, so www.emch.co.uk. Uh, all our content is free to access. There's a lot of video content you can view. There's a various reports and downloads. Uh, the pattern book will be uh, available through that in due course. That's about spring next year, so that would be sort of March 2022 uh, that that would be made available uh, through both the Stuart Mon website and also the MCH website. So it's a good place to go for those interested in further dialogue. And you can get in contact with the partners if you wish as well through that website. There's a inquiries at email address if you want to contact people. Perfect. So fit and forget solutions, but don't forget the uh, the website name. That's where you've got to kind of go to go for. Um, Stuart, Jane, thank you um, for your time. It's really interesting. Um, and as they still keep coming back to the fact that you can build a house in seven hours. When I think about what I can do in a, in, in a day, I'm suddenly feeling very inefficient. Um, but that, that's great. You don't get away without the final question that we've been asking all our guests. Um, and that's about if you're going to move home, who would you like to have as a neighbour and why? And sure, I'm thinking there must be a golf course somewhere in here for you. 
Well, I, I must, uh, you know, I must uh, move house to near a golf course. And if I had my neighbour, um, I would probably go with Tiger Woods because he's my kind of golf and idol. Uh, he's probably got a lot of good stories to tell me as well over a beer one night as well. So that would be great. So next to a golf course with Tiger Woods as my mate would be fab. Sounds, sounds good. I'm on the tee with you. I'll, I'll make up. Do you, Jane, do you want to make up our four ball or who would you like to be as your <laughs> neighbour? Possibly. Do you know, I had a good think about this and I would say um, Alan Titchmarsh on the basis I have not been blessed with um, green fingers, but I live in a very competitive neighbourhood when it comes to gardens and plants. So I think I could do with some help on that front so that he would definitely be my choice. <laughs> well, he could tend the golf course. Well, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you both very much. Um, and thank you to everyone that's listening and uh, join us for our next conversation in due course. Bye.